Good evening, everybody. Sorry, we're a little late getting started. Uh, welcome. Why don't we uh, go ahead and get started? We've got a pretty full agenda, so um, pretty much uh, mostly financial items on the agenda this evening. So the first item we have is the FY13 year-end financial um, report, and there's an update to it that's coming around. Yeah, so the old, the old one comes out. Mr. Mayor, um, if, if, um, if I might, before we begin, if we could just take a moment of uh, silence and reflection for the victims of the um, events of today, yeah, that you. might be appropriate. Thank you. Why don't we do that? Thank you, and all those families will certainly be in our, on our hearts and minds. Uh, thank you, Mayor Baruch, members of council. Uh, tonight is uh, all of the items on the agenda have uh, a financial dimension to them. So this is Richard LeCondre's night. Uh, for our, uh, to walk through the order, we'll, we'll uh, walk through the year-end financial report for FY13, which we traditionally do at this time of year after our books are closed. Um, and then from there, have a discussion um, you know about our revenues, our expenditures, our our fund balance status at, at FY13 year end, and then uh, have a discussion of um, proposed carry forwards of projects that were funded in the prior fiscal year but not completed, um, and then um, a bond resolution for capital projects that are approved in the CIP. Um, we will, in tonight's presentation, this is, uh, we use the FY13 information as our latest financial data on the city's financial condition. But I would note that our multi-year look and our trends and a lot of deeper analysis um, we are scheduled for in November as we do our FY15 budget planning and we do that joint with the school board. So tonight's uh, presentation is not intended to be a multi-year forecast, but instead uh, just an update in terms of what we're seeing on the revenue side and how we ended FY13, uh, how we ended the fiscal year there. So with that introduction, if I could turn it over to Richard. <coughs> Happy Monday, Council. Happy Monday. And before I get started, um, to my right is Melissa Ryman. This is my deputy. She's the person that helps <coughs> with Munis. She's the Munis support person for our organization. Um, she prepares the financial statements. Um, we work together on charts and graphs that we present to council. So, and she's here to assist me tonight in case I stumble. <laughs> you can say that. <laughs> All right. We're going to start out um, with the report the financial report it had a cover letter we updated it earlier today um, and we'll start with the um, first spreadsheet I will use the narrative to touch upon a few things but um, <coughs> we'll start with this bottom line the surplus for 2013 unaudited was 2.169 million all right, it's $2,169,000. The breakdown is as follows. If you look at the revenue, you'll see that revenue exceeded budget by $2.8 million. I will highlight some of those areas. Um, they include certainly the three and a half cent tax rate increase, which generated an additional $1.7 million in tax revenue. You'll note that Personal property, sales tax, meals tax, BPO, and other taxes are what we use as our local tax indicators. And those were all at or ahead of budget except for sales tax. And we'll talk about the sales tax and its implications in a little more depth. However, if you look at personal property year over year, personal property is up 3.26%. Um, if you read the summary that I sent, the cover memo, you'll see that what I've done is I've talked about what happened between 11 and 12 and 12 and 13. 
and what you'll notice there is that there's been a drop in the revenue growth overall in these indicators. Looking further, meals tax, BPO, other taxes, they're all up, but not as much as they were between 11 and 12. <coughs> Sales tax um, started sliding in April, and we've been watching it monthly, and as it turns out, um, it is down 6.74%. We will continue to monitor that in the 14 budget. We will also work with the Commissioner of Revenue to make sure there were no errors because uh, there are occasions where our tax money is given to another jurisdiction or vice versa. Or vice versa. <laughs> well, vice versa. <laughs> we're, we're hoping that some of our tax money was given to another jurisdiction. But because we watched it for three months and watched it slide the whole three months, I, I'm not thinking that that's the case. But we will continue to look. And again, going forward, we will monitor where we are in terms of the sales tax revenue. Now, it does raise some concerns about FY14, and we'll cover that in a minute. On the expenditure side, um, expenditures were down from the year before by 11%. Our underspending was down from the year before. Um, if you look at the um, total expenditure line, you'll see that we underspent by $3.45 million. Now, there's a reason for it, and we'll go through and highlight some of those items where the underspending occurred and why. Um, we also took the opportunity this year to include a column for encumbrances. So you can see the things that the city was committed to and legally obligated to include as our expenditures, and you'll see that as a use of fund balance. All right, so let's go through the legislative branch. Uh, 478,000 underspent, um, but if you recall, we did allocate money for legal expenses because that litigation got uh, put on hold during the water negotiations, we didn't use that money. Executive management, you had $208,000 um, that was underspent. Um, most of that was HR. We, we did do some training, but we didn't do as much as we had intended to, and that will be one of the carry forward items that we'll be talking to you about with the budget amendment. No. 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 We double check. All right, if you go down a little further to public safety, public safety underspent by 134.6 thousand. Um, that can be attributed to one major item and that was a, a vehicle that was supposed to be purchased with seized assets. We didn't purchase the vehicle. Um, that will also be a carry forward. Going to the next line, human services, $309,000. Um, primarily that was um, underspending in grants, um, 145,000 in social services contracts, 78,000 in uh, CSA, and 55,000 Arlington. Next item was public works, 135,000 underspent. 80,000 of that had to do with a CMAC grant. That money will be reallocated. Developmental services is the next big line. That's $381,000. Uh, 350 of that is a grant that was for um, the Route 7 study. That's controlled by MVTC, so they're going to control that spending, and we didn't spend any money during 13. So the bottom line is we had a surplus of 2.1 million. When you add that to the beginning fund balance of 14.8 million, you have an ending balance of a little over 17 million dollars. Now, out of that 17 million, 
That's the total fund balance. There were charges against the fund balance. That includes the encumbrances, 514,000. Um, there were other items um, that I will go into if you have questions about them, but the major item was $1,478,000, which you allocated to the FY14 budget. And that leaves you a fun, unassigned fund balance at June 30th of 14,491,000, which is slightly less than your beginning fund balance. That represents 20.47% of the FY13 expenditures. Now, while that number seems to be high, um, recognize that um, 3% of uh, the 14 million would, would be approximately uh, 420,000 dollars, and that would take you down to 17 percent. So all you need is one major expenditure, um, and you're right back down to 17 percent. Any questions? I'm going to go around. Why don't we start with Phil and then just go around the horn? Uh, just, just generally speaking, is the information presented on these charts about the same as what was passed around at the Budget Finance Committee meeting on Thursday? Yes. Okay, thanks, because I looked at those. And we talked about those, as you know. So, okay, I want to uh, pick up where I left off when I was uh, attending the Budget and Finance meeting, which is to say, uh, you know, there's a story here, and we need to tell it in as positive a way as possible. Uh, one way to look at this is to say we have a $2.169 million surplus uh, in a year when we raise taxes three and a half cents. Um, uh, three and a half cents would throw off how much? How much is it per penny now? About $342,000. So $2.1 million surplus, if we had not raised taxes, uh, would have dropped that surplus down to a million something, roughly. Is that is that correct? Uh, the way you're calculating it, that, that's okay. true. Well, as you, you, know, you know how I'm calculating it, because that's what you hear from people out in the community. Right. Okay, so that's one way to look at it. And uh, that way to look at it has uh, the government basically trying to keep the tax rate as low as possible uh, until such time that we uh, go to bond uh, on the major capital projects that we have ahead of us. Um, and that's sort of the philosophy that, that we heard in the budget discussions uh, last spring from one side. Uh, the compromise side ended up, and I ended up supporting the compromise, was to sort of split the baby. And so what we have now is a, you would feel comfortable, would you, saying that 20.47% fund balance, it's, it's above policy, right? Policy is 12 to 17. That's correct. Okay, so we're, we're reasonably comfortable with where we ended up. And, uh, you know, the tax rate was the tax rate. I mean, some thought it was too high, some thought it was not high enough, but it was a happy medium. And, and we have now a $2.1 million surplus, which we can start this new year with. Uh, is that? No, sir. That's not what we well, No, we sir. You have a $2.1 million surplus, but you committed $1.4 million to your 14 budget. So that right. is no longer available. The 2.1 is built into the, the budget that we have, that we're living under right now. That's correct. Okay. Um, okay, um, I think the story that we take away from this is that we, we're, we're in decent shape. Um, uh, we budget conservatively. Uh, some revenues were not what we hoped for. Some were okay. Uh, we go into, you know, the challenges that lie ahead uh, in, in decent standing to meet those challenges within a tax rate that is reasonable, and I won't pin you down on what reasonable means, but within a reasonable tax rate. Uh, is that generally what you'd say, or is that going too far? Uh, I would say that's going too far. Um, let's just 
take it one point at a time. Okay, thanks. Um, you have a surplus of 2.1. You committed 1.4 out of your current surplus to your 14 budget. The 1.4 million that you committed to your 14 budget covered holes that were in the budget because the tax rate was not enough to accommodate what we wanted to do. If you rolled over to 15 today with the very same numbers, you would not fund PAYGO, which is 625,000. So if you have the difference between 2.1 and 1.4, you've already spent it without the budget growing. I'm, I know I've been through this once, but just for you know the average person following from home, could you, I know what PAYGO means in the congressional context, but what does <laughs> PAYGO mean in the right. city context? All right. PAYGO means that for your capital improvement program, you're using cash as opposed to debt financing. So um, again, what we put into the 14 budget was a pay-go item of $525,000, I believe. Um, you did not have revenue to cover it, so that was part of what you used uh, your fund balance for. That means that in the 15 budget, that's not there because you don't have the fund balance. You're not saying that you're committing 1.4 to the 15 budget. So you have that hole. It just so happens that the way we plan the CIP, your pay as you go is $100,000 more than it was in 14. All right, so you have 700,000 of unassigned fund balance that's free, but if I were recommending something to you, I would say the first thing that you should do for 15 is cover your pay go. Otherwise, what you're looking at is another $600,000 worth of debt. Okay, but you've talk, we've talked about assigned fund balance as opposed to unassigned fund balance. Okay, thanks. That's, uh, you know, others who've been around the horn more often uh, should ask the questions now, but that's a good introduction. Thank you. Mr. Cowan. Well, thank you, Phil. Uh, as an observer to the Budget and Finance Committee, uh, Glad to see you've done the summary of the meeting for us, for Johanna and me. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Appreciate your uh, participation. Uh, I'll wait. Just make, sure to, make sure to call in in first next time. <laughs> I'm going to. <laughs> yes. yes, I think that would be preferred, <laughs> that the people who represent the budget and finance uh, committee get a chance to speak to it rather than an ongoing conversation. Uh, I will wait and see how the rest of the conversation goes and provide comments uh, in the future. <coughs> Barry. And having been at that meeting uh, uh, as well, um, uh, I, did, you know, I, I will also wait and see what anybody else has to, has to ask. I think that uh, Mr. LaCondre explained um, encumbrances and uh, he will explain um, carry forwards as well um, as we start to talk about um, available revenue because that always becomes a very dangerous topic and uh, I think as this this conversation has indicated there really isn't um, significant available revenue and so um, it's important that everybody understand that um, you know what this uh, what these numbers really entail and I think Mr. LaCondre began to to talk about it but when we come back around the horn if you could talk about um, the difference being carried forward and um, encumbered that'd be great. So I, I'm, I'm going to try to um, ask some questions that hopefully can clarify some of the issues that we talked about so far. And we tend to have this discussion every year. And I think part of it is because of our unique budget cycle um, and when the billings happen versus our fiscal year. And at some point we were talking about correcting it so there wouldn't be this confusion so we don't have this conversation year out and year, out, year in, year out. But that's not where the council wanted to go. So here's yet my numerous attempts to try to clarify where we're at with surpluses and deficits. Um, and what I'm trying to get at is what I'm going to label as sort of the true surplus, mm -hmm. which I don't think we've talked about quite yet. I think it was sort of in lost a little bit in the numbers, and I think that gets to um, Phil's point. Um, so when we take out the tax increase because of the billing situation, 
um, in order to generate the revenue, which is what you were trying to get at, which is sort of what everybody anticipated, but yet we're now saying, whoa, we've got the surplus. Well, that's not the case for folks who are deep into the budget discussions. And again, unfortunately, I think this is in part because of the way that we do our budgeting and calendaring situation that they're not in sync. Um, so when we take out the tax increase portion of it and on, on items that we would have spent but for the fact that we just didn't get around to, say, using the asset forfeiture funds like purchasing the vehicle, et cetera, um, what is that true surplus? What is that number? Do we have that at this point? Uh, I can I can tell you. Um, uh, it it starts out like this. Uh, your revenue exceeded your budget. Can, can we can we have the number and then maybe work it backwards? I, I'm going to tell you the number. Okay. All right. I was just trying to explain first. Okay. All right. Um, this sheet. Okay. Um, where the over and under column is. Um, if you go where to the line where it says subtotal revenues, it's two million eight hundred and fifteen thousand one eighty. <clears throat> okay, if you take away the tax surplus, that was the money that you gained as a result of the tax rate increase. It's approximately one point seven million dollars. Right. Where, where are we seeing that? If you go to the top line where it says real property taxes in the over under column, mm -hmm. it's one million six ninety three six thirty six. Mm -hmm. That is basically the rate increase. If you subtract that number from the two point eight, you have about one point one million. Out of that one point one million. If you subtract the encumbrances of 514,000, you're left with approximately 600,000. Okay. That would be your true surplus. Got it. Okay. So that's the true surplus that we're talking about when you take away those numbers. So. Surplus to when, but right. the, the part that everybody forgets is we have to look at what happens next year. Right. And to, to they, the, the bottom concept is the, 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 to the extent your surplus this year isn't as big as the carry forward last year, you start with the deficit already, yes. right? Yes. Unless you can eliminate one-time expenses, which brings you back to the pay-go, and there's not even going to be enough to cover that gap. And I know Ira's figured this out in his head. So while, but Bill, I understand it, it looks good this year. The issue is if you don't have that big a surplus this year, and with sales tax and a few things changing, if you're trending in the wrong direction, and you're not going to have that boost of the tax increase again because it doesn't keep in, it's not a there's not a velocity to it it's re, it's reached a level you, you're already going to be in the hole for next year unless you underspend by that that amount this year right right, right. And, and I think that's an excellent point and, and the point that I'm trying to drive towards is really that cushion that we're talking about is six hundred thousand yes that's unless we you know and, and, and I think you're going to get into it next about what the trend lines are showing and I think that's why you're throwing some caution flags out because the numbers are not growing at the same rate that we saw before and in fact things may be flattening a little bit that that you're raising that point so when we start looking at the true surplus of 600,000 that's really not a lot of um, wiggle room as one might initially think from the beginning of the presentation but I'll, I'll turn it over and then we can go around again Vice Mayor Smith thanks I'll defer my comments till later Mr. Ron. Ron or I'm sorry Dave yeah, just a question or two for you. It seems like a fairly large um, change in sales tax, 6.7%, when the other numbers are trending upwards, although albeit slightly. Does that seem unusual to you that you'd have that kind of drop? Yes, okay. and we started talking about this in April, all right? And again, um, what makes me believe that it is not um, some clerical error at the state level is that it started out as um, three or four percent in April, then it was five percent in May, and now it's 6.74. Now, I is it unusual? Yes, particularly if you look at what has happened in the prior years, <coughs> okay? Um, but we will continue to monitor it, and we will check to make sure that it wasn't a clerical error. 
Or the sales tax does not include meals uh, or other. It's just sale of retail, basically products. Yes. Um, what is that total amount? Uh, I know I could look at it if I had reading glasses. Um, what is that amount approximately for uh, for this year? So the sales tax was uh, $3,737,117. And so uh, there must be like the top three account for a pretty good amount of that, I would guess, like BJ's and grocery store or two. Is that right or is it spread out? over a whole bunch of businesses for the most part? Um, basically, when we get sales tax breakdowns, um, we can get them by major industry, but we really don't get them by um, individual taxpayer. Gotcha. Um, we are not privy to that. The Commissioner of Revenue may have that information, but we don't. However, having said that, because we have this um, contract with BJ's, I can tell you that BJ's met their target. Okay. All right. So if you make an assumption that they provide a good portion of the retail sales, then they were okay. As for the others, I couldn't tell you. That seems really strange when you put them, and I imagine they were one of the top one or two. You didn't say that they've met if their goals. If you make that assumption, then that means correct. something else is really out of whack because they make yes. up a much smaller percent. Yes. Is there a way to actually check? I mean, how do you do other than saying, hey, you sure this is right? Is there any way to confirm that the numbers are um, right? Again, we can look at it by um, industry category, and that will give us a little insight. You can start to um, drill down to see what particular area it was and knowing what how you're constructed here in terms of sales tax retailers you can get a pretty good indication of what's down. But we have not done that at this point in time. But again, um, I start out by having the conversation with the Commissioner of Revenue. He tells me, if he tells me, um, no, there were no errors that we know of. And uh, at this point, I'm pretty confident there weren't any because we did this in May. And he told me then that we didn't have that problem. Okay. All right, so Thanks. now the question is, um, can we get a breakdown by, you know, industry category, and that'll help us to identify where um, there was um, that contraction. Thank you. Okay. Oh, now I got more. Okay. All right. Um, having seen the contraction in the revenue categories, is, again, I talked about the local taxes. Um, Personal property tax increased 16% in FY12 over FY11, but between 12 and 13, it was only 3%. Meals tax was 6% from 11 to 12, but less than 2% from 12 to 13. BPOL, 6% growth between 11 and 12, 2% in 13. Now, when you look at that, and, and we did, and we said, well, let's look at our uh, 14 revenue numbers because, I mean, this is June. We gave you our best guesses in April. So turn to the next sheet. What we did is we laid out the 14 budget against the actual revenues for 14. In almost every category except sales, our budget for 14 is less than the actual revenues for 13. So that gives us a level of comfort. We are not 5% or 6% under or over. We're 3%, 2%. So what that tells me is if we reach the same levels, which is being flat in 14, if we have the same numbers that we had in 13, we should be fine, right? Again, the one outlier at this point in time is sales tax. Total sales tax is 111,000 more in the budget than the actual um, revenue that we had in 12. So again, we will watch that and see if we make up the 111 or if it's something that's going to be permanent. And certainly if after the uh, fourth or fifth month of this fiscal year, 
if we start to see all the revenue flattening out, we will alert council and we'll have that discussion. All right. Okay. All right. Any other questions on this? Okay. Why don't we uh, move to the next item, which is the carry forward ordinance. And uh, before we get to that particular ordinance, there's two items. Excuse oh, me, sorry. Mr. Mayor. Uh, we have a little slideshow oh, sure. for you. That, so that, that segues into the next ordinance item. Okay. Again, this will be real quick. Um, we've already discussed that, we just got done. But what we wanted to do was lay it out for you graphically. So here's 11, 12, 13, 14, right? And you can see just by looking at personal property, personal property looks like it went up over 10% <coughs> between 11 and 12. But between 12 and 13, it's a much smaller number. Okay, and you can go right down the line and, and see that same trend. The rate of growth is slowing. All right, this is our um, fund balance comparison to expenditures. The yellow is the 17% mark, and as you can see, it, at as of 13, we're up over $14 million. Um, if you look at the, um, the blue line, um, that's your 12% of expenditures. The bars themselves represent unassigned fund balance. Here's fund balance broken down. You have your total fund balance, and then you have the things that we are committed to doing. Um, 12, if you notice, we had restricted grants. Those are grants that we can't spend on anything else except the particular items that we received the grant for. Um, you have uh, your school district debt service, and you have uh, purchase orders. In 13, um, that, I guess it's brown, <laughs> we can't see it as clearly up here, and I'm old. Uh, you'll see um, uses for next year. That's your biggest bar in the assign column. All right, again, the blue is unassigned. Um, that's your $1.478 million. Um, and then you have the other items which run about the same thing every year. Carry forwards. Now, um, the question about carry forwards and encumbrances. Encumbrances are things that council has obligated, has obligated itself to do, or has created a contract which obligates us to complete a particular task. Carry forwards are more discretionary. Um, they may be internal projects that departments have started on but and had money for but didn't get to complete um, you would have those things in um, like we have economic development consulting contracts um, we know we need to do those things so we've allocated money from the existing budget to do it um, Hutton Avenue sidewalk road paving we decided that that was something that we wanted to complete it was not budgeted in 14. We had leftover money in 13, so we chose to commit it to that. You will make that commitment when you pass the budget amendment. Then it becomes almost like an encumbered fund. Um, Mr. LaCondre, when you said we chose, is that because we've agreed to, as a matter of law, commit to that, or that's a staff recommendation? Um, Hutton Avenue is the staff. Well, the, uh, the council actually did approve a, a budget amendment of $50,000 to do the Hutton Avenue sidewalk and road paving in FY13. That, pro that hasn't been done yet because of the pace of their project, and so the request would be to carry that forward to FY14 so we could get it done now. Right. I'm, I'm just trying to establish that are all the carry forward similar in that we've made a legal commitment of one kind or another, 
or or some of these staff recommendations that we have some discretion to accept or reject? They're all things that were intended to get done in the FY13 budget, but didn't get done. So, so they had they were approved in the FY13 budget. Uh, they didn't get done, and now it is a discretionary. And, and you're not contractually council. obligated right. to do it. Um, so for each of them, they're, they represent underspending in the specific area that would be carrying forward. In economic development, that's in the EDO budget for consulting services that we didn't use. The request is to carry that forward to FY14 so we can use it in FY14. So these were previously all in the budget but then didn't get done. So the that's question right. is we could do them or couldn't do them. But yes. If I could, as the ADA coordinator, so. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to just say as the ADA coordinator, whether or not it's in the budget, if we get a request, we're legally going to do it, so I would recommend we fund it. But the light timing, I defer to. Is, the, is this dogpile on carry forwards time? I don't want to miss my chance. <laughs> uh, so is it your judgment that uh, it's interesting that the number rounds out to a nice even 250000 Is it your judgment that it's budgetarily responsible to spend two hundred fifty thousand dollars on these or something like these um, the second part of that question implies that I'm not totally sure that all of these have gone through a current recent kind of you know vetting scrutiny let's look at it again let's compare it to other pressing needs but 250 grand is that responsible to spend or would you advise that we just not spend it I would advise that you spend it particularly um, some of them, it's it's something that you need to do. And if you don't do it now and it's not budgeted for 14, it becomes a crisis in 14 or a crisis in 15 and you have no money. I, I, I mean, Ron raised an important point, which sort of uh, hasn't been emphasized. I mean, there's a reason that the Virginia state budget is a, on a, bis uh, a biannual basis. It's two years. It's very difficult. I understand why what you're saying we're looking for just this year, but in fact, if you don't look at the next year as well, you're not going to really understand what the implications are. Uh, there are a number of one-time uh, revenue uh, considerations. The uh, 414,000, excuse me, the um, legal fees mm -hmm. is a one-time revenue benefit, will not appear next year likely. Uh, it, there's a number of things that we carry, for, we have grants that we call revenue, but they're really not something that is uh, a durable, I think you used the word, Johanna, a durable revenue. Mm -hmm. It depends after we do it. So it's not something that you can say that we can spend it, as we, you said, it's very restricted. Uh, I find this, uh, uh, and the 600000 that you referred to, if I'm not mistaken, tell me if I'm missing something, didn't we cut the pay go in the budget by about 600000 to get the FY14 budget approved? 680000 Okay, so is that maybe that's in part so where the 600000 comes to because we cut it from the budget and we're going to have to make it up and we're going to have to make up the fact that the uh, we estimated the fund balance to be below 17 percent so that has to be covered as well this is as we expected is not particularly surprising uh not particularly good news there's really no extra money here to speak of uh, when you get into the fact that the city's budget will have to grow for fy15 if nothing else to handle uh budgetary expenses that are legally re required such as pensions and uh, health care for the city staff and other increases in expenditures, not to mention, uh, as we have been told, that there is a substantial increase in uh, student population. And that will no doubt produce significant increase in costs. I think, in fact, the 15 budget is pretty grim, uh, and it's going to be a very real challenge uh, to meet it. And again, the way this works, if you underestimate your expenditures or overestimate your revenues and you end up with a shortfall, 
at the end of the year, it has to be made up. One of the reasons we had a, a situation in FY10 where 17 FTEs had to be cut at the last minute is we ran into a shortfall. And since the schools have no ability to adjust their budget at all, all of the cuts that would be required if there is a shortfall have to come from the city side. So running a small surplus is something we should always be shooting for because there's no room to, to maneuver should there be surprises in the revenue stream. So that's my takeaway from this. Uh, Richard has provided a pretty flat presentation, but I'm a little bit concerned about the, uh, again, the, the fiscal situation of the city remains very tenuous, uh, and 15 is going to be very difficult. All right. All right. Um, leading these past two slides lead up to the resolutions that we're about to present to council. Um, the first one was the carry forwards. Um, this one is has to do with the uh, resolution to bond. In FY14, we budgeted a little less than 300000 for debt service. Um, because of the date in which we plan to go to market, um, it's unlikely that we will have to spend um, any money on interest in the 14 fiscal year. Uh, so our first payment may be July or August of 15, but in 15, we're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of $1.6 million for debt service. So that's... And Richard, we we had this discussion, I, I believe, at budget and finance, but the debt service, the 1.6, is fairly, is, uh, the, the, the overall expenditure is fairly split between school and um, city costs? Yes. Something like 19 million in terms of, we're going out to 18. So that'll be the next That's the next slide, we'll okay. We'll go into right. detail as to what's okay. the breakout of what right. will be bonded. This is the overall uh, debt service increase associated with that issuance, which is a $1.65 million increase in debt service. Now, if you net that out of about a million dollar decrease in debt service because of some refinancing that we have done in the past two years, um, our existing debt will go, the cost of that on an annual basis will go down by a million dollars. So the net increase on debt service for FY15, if all of the bonds that are laid out in the, in the resolution um, are issued, uh, we anticipate would be approximately $360,000 net increase in FY15. Bless you. Bless you. I thought so that was not a motion. <laughs> 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 it's your. Here's your debt service graph. You'll see we're within policy limits. So again, the, the blue is our existing debt that's outstanding, so that steps down in 2015, and then the, the new debt uh, is the, uh, the white with the diagonal lines through it in, F in FY15. Looking ahead, uh, in November at the Joint Council and School Board Budget Planning Session, um, we will give you the latest and greatest for FY14, which includes our analysis of whether we're meeting our revenue targets for 14 or not. But we'll also look at um, forecasting for two th uh, 2015 and beyond. Anything? With that, I'm finished. Anything else on the slides? Could you go back to the debt service slide? That, no, uh, sorry, the graph. So, is that good? Yes, sir. That's excellent. Okay. All right. Um, our debt ceiling is 12%. That's the red line, and we're well below the 12%. It would be somewhere around um, $8.5 million if, to get to the 
Is it, uh, I'm sorry, I think you just answered the question I'm going to ask. Uh, the capacity to borrow more would amount to, um, uh, we could borrow eight and a half million more and still be within policy, is that what you just said? Yes. Well, we could borrow up to eight and a half million total. Up to eight and, and a half still million be total. Within policy, still. Well, just to be clear, service. the that's annual the debt, debt service. That's, that's the, the debt service, not sure. borrow eight million. Okay. The debt service. To borrow eight million. So how much? So what's the debt? Yeah, right. That's what I'm asking. Thank you. The so debt is eight and a half million. No, that would be no. your ceiling. That's the oh, debt never service. mind. I'm sorry. Yeah. Why debt service would be eight and a half million. Right. Now the debt much, itself. How much could we borrow? There you go. Over that twenty million dollars that you just spent on the first loan. Back of the envelope. It'd be about sixty million. Yes, yeah. rates are going up. And we will have that forecast in November. I mean, this is something you need to have a multi-year look at because that line shoots up through the yeah. through the roof. Th I mean, that's in 2016. And, and we know that the CIP is quickly going to well, eat that capacity up. So, got to include the schools' costs. Well, that's right. I mean, what what Richard just showed does not include the CIP. I understand. And what's included in that, so we'll see that shortly about what that line looks like once you incorporate the CIP. Mr. Cam? Well, so <clears throat> that's a policy limit, but it has only as much meaning as your cash flows permit you to pay for your debt service. So in itself, it really doesn't tell you a lot. I don't disagree. Okay. So this is a classic ALM, asset liability management issue. So you could go up. It's like somebody who could borrow, you know, borrow, technically permitted to borrow $600,000 mortgage for their house, but actually doesn't have the cash flow or it's so tenuous, any interruption in their cash flow when they lose the house. You have to be very careful. And these percentages I've mentioned many times were designed when there was actually a relationship between housing values and, uh, or the, let me put it this way, building values of buildings and the, the ability to borrow, that has been broken a long time ago. So there's all sorts of mis uh, misalignments. And in a sense, yes, I mean, we are facing uh, whether we could actually carry uh, more than 60 million or so. It really depends on the, on the, on the cash flows that the city experiences, including increases in operating costs, uh, which can be expected to increase substantially particularly, I've said many times, the school costs are going to go up by leaps and bounds. And we'll see what's left over for cash to pay for the debt service. That's correct. And um, I would just like to, to caution my, my fellow council members. When we come to the discussion about the carry forward, the, the 250000 um, you know, as you as you look at, at those those particular items, it looks like a sort of a wish list. And um, you know, and and I honestly uh, think some of them are 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 less um, you know uh, uh, critical and substantial than others. But I just remind everybody that these were decisions that were taken and codified by a vote back in uh, FY13, and they have a they have a life and. Uh, they have their own life within the um, operations on the city side, and so um, if we uh, have other things to do, let's let's do other things and not go back and revisit a decision that was made in the last budget cycle. Um, as I say, you know, the the light show for the for the council buzzer system doesn't doesn't strike me as 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 nearly as as substantive as something else, but it was a decision that was made. And, and staff has built program around it, and, and I'd rather not, not revisit the rationale for some of those numbers. Okay. All right, should we jump into the budget ordinance? Um, and before we do, there's two items that I just wanted to highlight. Um, one regarding the, I believe it's the purchase of the boilers for um, the Winter Hill Apartments that I own um, my home at 243 Thank Gundry you. Drive. Um, and that my wife is president of the Winter Hill Community Association, which is the townhomes 
and uh, I can consider these matters fairly and objectively in the public interest. And on the item about Hunton Avenue paving, um, again, um, as I previously disclosed, my daughter is um, on the waiting list and also in the process of being enrolled at the Child Development Center, and I can consider the, the matters fairly and objectively and in the public interest, given that both, both matters um, impact various groups, not just myself. So. Mr. Mayor, um, are we on discussing a couple of the particular items on proposed TO 13-24? Is that where we are? That's just where we are. Yeah, sure. I think so. Okay. I, I, and, and maybe we can just, uh, I think it's fairly clear what the items are. I don't know if we need a full staff presentation okay. on it. These are issues or items that, that were previously um, in the budgets and expenditures, so they're, they're carryovers, so perhaps we can have a brief discussion about it. I, I do uh, actually, Mr. Mayor, a couple a couple points. Um, the uh, boilers for the Winter Hill apartments. Um, you know, we're when our commitment to affordable housing is talked about. I'm always concerned that we're not fully explaining to the public how much we really put into affordable housing. And so I think a key point to be made here is that whatever the set-asides in new developments are, that this is an example of our support for affordable housing that needs to be considered when we talk about overall public commitment to affordable housing. That would be the point that I would make. It's not disagreement. Now I want to go to the emergency services unit vehicle for the police a minute. Can you, um, can you explain Explain to me what that unit is. Uh, this unit will uh, provide, during emergency response, a, um, a vehicle for command staff so that we can establish incident command for an incident. Um, it, it's important to have the resources all in the field for incident command. It's also very important, particularly for uh, multi-jurisdictional response, which we often have in the city. When mm -hmm. they come to the scene, they're disoriented. They need to know where the incident command is, and having a vehicle that is so clearly marked um, helps with the overall uh, management of an incident um, to establish that, that location. Now, how many incidents a year? In other words, what I'm getting at is, is, is this a vehicle, and again, I'm not saying that would be my impression, but is this a vehicle that's just going to sit in the parking lot for everything but 300 and that would sit in the parking lot for 350 days a year? No, it would be year used throughout the year. It would, um, it would be part of the, the regular use of fleet. Okay. Um, but when we have natural disasters or um, a, um, interjurisdictional police response, then it would be deployed specifically to set up incident command. Right. Now, mm -hmm. we, we know we had an ultra-serious incident last Saturday night, and um, I'm personally interested because it seems to me this is an expenditure that might conceivably help for that type of incident in the future. I'm particularly interested in any other resource or policy needs that come out of the after action report yeah. with regard to um, the um, ultra serious events at the Eden Center. So if I could have that commitment, I'd appreciate it. And, and just if we can pa pause on that point one just for a moment, um, I did have a conversation with Mr. Shields and asked him um, for some follow-up okay. to the council. So um, that may happen um, uh, either at a meeting, possibly closed, depending on what the nature turns out to be, um, or via email. Um, so, so I have asked Mr. Shields when an incident happened. Um, I did immediately follow up with him about it, just so council is aware of that. And I did as well. And when I'm interested in policy and resource recommendations, I'm interested not just for the city of Falls Church, but regionally. And if there's state legislation that may be suggested from this, uh, I would be interested in knowing that too, so that, that we can put that into our legislative request. Thank you. Could I ask a Thank you. Could I ask a process question? So uh, am I to understand that tonight we're going to be asked to uh, approve something to see at our next chambers meeting that will include all the items from line 46 down. Um, mm -hmm. Well, we're not being asked to approve it tonight. We're it, it, at most what we're going to do is uh, see if there's consensus to place it on the calendar. That's I'm sorry, you're, you're correct. Uh, 
That's what I meant to say. To place it on the calendar. Okay. Uh, did I actually vote for the light timers? I just – is that something we Th – That's out of uh, the council contingency light item is $7,500 in the budget. Anytime there's any use of council contingency, that does require a council action. Mm -hmm. And so we've wrapped um, okay. the lights and the um, and the contractors provide sign language into that council contingency. Okay. So those two are actually sort of separate from the other ones in, in I some respects. I thought we were separate and decided not to do it. I well, I'm, I'm not even going to go there, but that's what I, I thought, too. For the light timer? I remember yeah, that. I'm just trying to remember. I, 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 I certainly remember that Ron and I said we didn't think we needed that, yeah. but that's why uh, I, I – but okay. also I didn't want to go back and – Okay, well, you guys you guys fight that out. That That's <laughs> that, that's not my fight. Um, the other question I have, just in terms of process, so if we put this on the calendar, what we're telling the community is that we're going to spend $250,000 on these items, and we believe there's justification for doing that. You know, during the course of the budget discussions last spring, there were groups and there were items in the budget that were identified as unmet needs. And so I'm, I'm asking if the public would have an opportunity to come forward and express their desire to be included in what amounts really to a supplemental appropriation. Uh, is it accurate to tell people that this is going to be an item on the council agenda and if, you know, if Falls Church Arts wants $15,000 to pay their taxes or if the news press wants whatever they want to advertise or if affordable housing wants more money so they can, you know, get a couple more apartments, is this the time and place for them to do that? I mean, they're they're more than welcome to do that at any point. Um, certainly, the question could be that other things could get substituted out. So I don't think the council is bound by what we previously passed. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. It's very. Except once again, I I I caution the council not to go down the path. Of, of second guessing a decision that was made in the last budget cycle. Staff has built, you know, again, th the, the time to have had that conversation was last year. Staff has built programs and projects around these expenditures and, you know, I, th and to then go back and say, we now have a second bite at this apple, we're going to re we're going to rethink the programs that you have already begun to put into place. I don't think does staff, uh, you know, a service. And if uh, the 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 residents of the city want to weigh in on the budget um, uh, deliberations, I think that's exactly right. But the time to do it is during the budget deliberations, not not at this point. You know, halfway halfway through the process. So I would just, you know, I would just remind the rest of council that these. You know, as 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 they say, as as possibly frivolous as some of them sound, staff has already put programs and processes in place to spend this money, and then to second guess staff, I think is 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 a waste of of time and possibly um, debilitating. And, and, and let me process. let me just make one other observation on that point. I think we also have to be careful about the type of precedence it may set if we start going down one course and because there's a carryover decide to reverse course or do things differently in the budgeting process um, and I think we see it at different levels of government um, and I hope it doesn't happen in a city where it's known that because there could be carryover because we just can't get everything done because of our bandwidth and staffing limitations there's a race to be first to spend money because you're always worried that if you don't hit it at the end of the fiscal year, the council may come back and revisit those decisions. So I don't want to set up a situation where we're spending money in, in, in timing ways that may not be in logical order or in sequential step, but just department heads making decisions that they want to expend money first the beginning of the fiscal year because they may find themselves at the end where there's a surplus and they need to, there's, they're, then they're fighting for what they thought was already approved. So um, I would just point that, that that could be one intended consequences of perpetually revisiting these carryover issues. Mr. Kelly. Uh, I, 
you've touched on a number of points, uh, uh, Nader. One is, if we, we the council have been asking, for example, that the staff undertake a bunch of studies or they look at this and look at that, and w they are therefore unable to get to some of the programs because we've delayed it, it seems to be a little bit perhaps perverse that the, these programs then pay the price for our own inability to come to closure on some issues. Uh, and adding the approach that you said will make the process even more difficult. Plus, it's $250,000, which is not going to move the needle that much unless you look at these uh, items as, or the new items as taking care of particularly uh, uh, interesting groups that one may speak to. Uh, so I don't go along with, and for example, the Hutton Street uh, improvements. Uh, I've had a, <coughs> a long history of issues with the uh, CDC. <coughs> Cannot be accused of being a blind supporter mm -hmm. of it. Nonetheless, it's been agreed that it's going to be done, and Hutton Street is a mess, and it is not safe for the kids to have to go through Hutton Street with its cutouts and, and potholes and whatnot. So having made the decision to allow it to go forward, we should provide the monies to finish the job and let them do it properly so that it's actually safe. So, I mean, th there are considerations here uh, that maybe carry or didn't maybe in the legal obligation, but it is a legislative obligation and there's very good reasons for going forward. And I believe my credibility on this may be a little bit more since I have not been a strong supporter of the original CDC. Uh, in fact, I think I was the only person who voted against it. So, uh, but having done that, if it's going forward, it's got to go forward properly. Many people are around. Is there any other public person? Yeah, that, no, that's no that's problem. that's the only one. I, the only one I don't remember is the lights. And yeah. You know, whatever the council wants to do. I agree. So that's how yeah. we, small stuff that just didn't get done that we all need to be. The, the only question I have is the size of the compensation study and whether we need to spend all that money. So I'd just like offline some additional money. But I, I, I agree. I mean, money you, you look or less money, <laughs> but oh. <when laughs> additional information, <laughs> but less money. You see where I'm going with that? Good. Thank you. I'd like some additional money. More than less. I'm glad we said offline. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, no. Um, and. Um, I mean, I, thi I think the, the prior presentation indicated that we've done a pretty good job of project projecting things. <coughs> we've maintained the 17 percent that we've been shooting for in terms of the responsible fund balance. And we've, I think now is not the time to begin encouraging a lot of new demands because we, we, we're sort of, <coughs> I think the balance that we've struck from my standpoint seems to be a pretty good one right now mm -hmm. and pretty responsible. And now is not the time to unhinge that, especially knowing what were the likely interests we'll have in the future in terms of demands. On the other hand, we've got some development projects that will hopefully help fund some of that and some other developments. But it seems to me overall a pretty prudent balance that we have right now and not a time to unhinge it. Right. Yep, and that's where I'm at. I don't think we necessarily need to revisit these issues or anything that shouldn't get done. So I think we should just go forward and – no, re no reason to retool this. What was discussed before? <coughs> and as I previously mentioned, at least on the federal grant monies, that um, anything that's going up to the feds shouldn't have my name or signature or name associated with it. All right. So this will be on the calendar for Monday. Okay. Then we are on to the bond resolution. So for, for the bond resolution, I would just um, point council to two charts that are in the staff report to, um, that, that provide information about the projects that are being funded. First, there's a question earlier about the breakdown by functional area as to where this, the, these bond proceeds would go, and that's in the first chart that's on the front page of the staff report. Um, for the general fund, it's a total of uh, $17,014,548. Um, of, of bonded uh, of bonded debt, and in the enterprise funds, a total of uh, one million eight hundred sixty-six thousand four hundred sixty-three dollars. Um, these would all be issued at one time uh, to lower the transaction costs. So, um, by functional areas, then um, in the area of IT and telecom, this is principally 
um, core infrastructure for the telecommunications for schools and general government um, to replace um, old equipment. In fire and police, there are upgrades at the fire station, um, the purchase of a new ladder truck and a new fire engine, and uh, repairs to our 911 call telecom infrastructure. Uh, City Hall facility improvements um, of $4,375,000. I'll go into a little bit more detail on that in just a moment. Schools at $7.8 million. Transportation, million uh, transportation improvements at just over a million. And park improvements at 430000 So then turning to the, the next page are the specific project breakouts. And these are all in, th in the approved capital improvements program. In total, at the bottom line, um, in the CIP, there's a total of $26.6 million worth of projects that are authorized for bond funding. Um, that has um, been tailored back to the $18.881 million that is, uh, that is proposed in this resolution. Um, so then the specific projects are listed down, and I will go down to the middle where we start talking about the general government uh, City Hall public safety renovations. The 3.4 million is for um, uh, not for any of the expansion that is proposed <coughs> in the CIP. Um, what this bond resolution would do, though, is fund the architecture and engineering work for studying potential expansion in the future. Uh, the 3.4 million is for infrastructure within the building, HVAC, energy efficiency, uh, fire safety, sprinklering, um, those types of projects in City Hall uh, that could proceed whether the building expands or not. Um, and then going down to the school projects, uh, we have 4 million uh, for the Thomas Jefferson School expansion, uh, 2.4 million for the Cherry Street preschool project, and one million for architecture and engineering for Mount Daniel. And then the school's replacement and modernization, which was approved in FY 2013, we have spent against that under a, a bond, re uh, under a, a resolution that will allow us to be reimbursed through the issuance of, uh, of this bond. <coughs> then in the area of transportation, we have 50,000 for bridge replacement, $800,000, which is the local match to VDOT Revenue sharing money, uh, it's a 50-50 match, so our 800000 uh, will result in $1.6 million of roadbed reconstruction uh, with a focus on Southwest Street as a, uh, as a street that uh, we will repair. Um, uh, the Broad Street and Pennsylvania Avenue signal at 200000 <coughs> West End Park development at $430,000, and then the two Enterprise Fund projects uh, sewer upgrades in uh, um, Alexandria at $1 million, and then stormwater improvements at $841,000. Um, so that's a summary of the projects. We'd be happy to answer any questions about them. Council members? Mr. Kelly? Uh, why, how do you decide? I noticed that all the school requests remain unchanged and all the cuts come from uh, the city side. How did you make that decision, Wyatt? Well, the the evaluation was what we thought was prudent in terms of having debt on our books that we'd be paying debt service for versus what we thought we had the ability to execute from a capital project management perspective. And so that really drove our uh, recommendations in terms of of the $26 million that's authorized, how much to pre proceed uh, with debt on. Um, and so that uh, really drove it all on the school side. Um, they have indicated to us the ability to proceed with each of those projects without any delay and that they will be able to expend those funds. And TJ, TJ will be a reimbursement for cash that's already been outlaid. From who? By the city. Again, under a reimbursement resolution that the council has adopted. So we've been able to expend those funds anticipating that we would issue bonds to cover it. Where did that show up in the expenditures for this year? Which, uh, where, which, which item did that show up in? Expenditures? It would show up in your um, capital projects fund, but it wouldn't f show up in the general fund financials that we just went over. It's a different fund. 
Well, it's got to show up in a consolidated balance sheet. Yeah, it's certainly be in the CAF. Yes, it'll be in the CAF and it'll be in the capital projects fund. There is a capital projects fund that will show up in the CAF, but it wouldn't be the types of information that we well, normally blind, conduct right, here. I mean, it still have to have money somewhere. Had to be money somewhere. Yes, there was money somewhere. Yeah. And it, but it wasn't it wasn't a general fund expense. It's a capital projects expense. We do have um, a capital projects module that tracks all the capital projects and when at the end of the year it gets accumulated and it's put into the CAFA. Okay. Anything else? Vice Mayor Snyder. Um, I've already gotten some questions from constituents on the city hall facility improvements and I tried to explain that regardless of whether we're in City Hall or we expand it or we're not in the present location, these are expenditures that we really need to make now. Is that a legitimate characterization? That's my understanding. Energy, efficiency, safety, um, things like sprinklers, that kind of thing. Is that, oh, would, did you is. sort of tell us a little bit more about, about that just so that we've got a, a good record on that? Let me, uh, uh, Ms. Mester can speak to it, but in general, uh, these are all items that are necessary for the operation of this building um, that are investments that we believe should be made regardless of what the future expansion uh, of the building or whether an expansion happens or not. Uh, we mm -hmm. think these are improvements that are necessary. But, but I, I think the question that we got, just so we're, we can focus the discussion a little bit, was essentially raising the building versus um, doing repair and deferred maintenance, yeah. which is what's being proposed. So I, th I think that's sort of part of the constituent notions that we've gotten. It, it, it was, but even what I tried to say was my understanding of these improvements is even if you, even if that were your plan, and I'm not saying it's the plan, all right, or any, or whatever, but even assuming you were going to do that, you would have to be in this building X number of years going forward and that this building needs this work now, as I understand it, for energy, for safety, for work environment, all those things. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but that was my understanding. That, that is correct, and um, so that's, that's the short answer. And so if there were any plan ultimately to raise the building or relocate elsewhere, that is a very lengthy and serious planning process, which we have not started. And yes. indeed, the, the council has made numerous commitments to keep City Hall at this location uh, for, for numerous reasons. So um, we do believe that these are necessary improvements um, that are needed now. Regardless of how that debate goes, that's the important thing. That's what I told the constituent. I just wanted to make sure that that was accurately reflected the reality here. Yes. Okay. Can we just stay on that point for one moment? But there are some expenditures here that go beyond that, that, that we also need to spend some time on. And that's on the A&E items dealing with um, City Hall, the rear expansion, and the parking, two separate items. So I, I think we need to just, before we move forward on that, have a brief discussion about those, those two items as well. So if, and, and I may, so if I may, Mayor, um, when we did the budget adoption, we had talked about all of the facilities for the 20 year and then pre presented a milestone chart with touch points on how to do those projects and council okayed proceeding with A&E up to 20% schematic design. So you had something to react to. We know what the basic energy and safety and what we could do on this building. And so to date, that's what the A&E is for that's on here, is to get us to that point. And so I did, have did encumbered. We, we, set, we set a mount on that, how much the, the max should be on the A&E? Yeah, well, the, that's um, was that in the legislative? That was in what was adopted in the CIP, okay. had the A&E, and that's what's before you in the bond. Mm -hmm. Resolution nope. is the A and E portions, the six seventy five, the three hundred. So, so we set in an amount for the A and E, is what I'm asking. Yeah, in the then project the descriptions, that was what was identified as the budget for A and E. Got it. Now, the architecture will be less than that, um, but uh, you know, the twenty percent architecture or schematics will be less than this dollar amount. 
but then to be able to continue to take those anywhere to answer further questions and to develop those is why we've uh, proposed here to have the full amount that was budgeted in the CIP for the A&E alone. And so I've encumbered with the contractor to do the 20% architecturals. Within that process, there's internal stakeholder input for adjacency and functionality, safety, fire safety, the judge for courts, and also council and planning commission work session and community input so that council has an informed community dialogue before we proceed any farther on city hall. So that is the only piece Mayor, to your point, where the A&E was authorized by council so that we could further that discussion of City Hall on site, what did the changes look like here? The rest of the items, um, the 3.4 is the HVAC window sprinklers and the uh, dormers and insulation for the attic because we are leaking heat like a sieve and melting ice for the ice sheeting on the roofs. And then to date, um, we have executed 968,000 of the 1 million critical renovations so far for City Hall for the IT sprinkler, the elevator overhaul, police evidence storage, the chimneys, the gutters, and then some asbestos and drainage issues um, to that point. Got it. And then uh, just if, if I, if Council can just uh, bear with me for one moment on the um, various uh, fire related. Um, items. I know that our um, contract discussions are still underway. Um, and I believe that quite hasn't come to resolution just yet. Um, is there a reason why we're taking this up Monday? The, um, the funding for the apparatus, we believe, is, is an obligation that we will have in any event how, how these negotiations go. And um, so we would recommend that we we move forward with that. If we miss this debt issuance, this is not something you want to do frequently because of the transaction costs, um, but we think this is um, the way to go in terms of how to finance uh, the engine and the ladder truck, and, and we don't think it can wait. Irrespective of how we end up doing the financing for their apparatus or what the – I mean, I, I guess what I'm driving at is the, the – that portion of the discussion is pretty much set as far as our um, our portion of what we would need to pay for the apparatus and maintenance. Yeah, I, I believe so. And, and um, now if there were a change, w what the anticipation is is that with this resolution, um, we will go forward, we'll have our ratings presentations um, in early November, uh, right? Uh, we, we do want to have the rating presentations after the, the voters have spoken on the on the uh, water referendum. Um, and so that would be the, – the rating presentations would be after that point, and then bond issuance would be in early okay. December. So, so, so we would have some wiggle room. We would have so, some So I guess room. what I would ask is this is on one point that, given our discussions about altering course, et cetera, given that that's a fluid discussion as I understand it right now. I'm saying in general, we've talked about no, we're, we, we don't want to keep altering course no. nor as a general policy matter. I just didn't know what you were yeah. doing. On the fire issues, I, I just want the legislative language to be clear that these are ongoing discussions, that if we revisit it, it shouldn't be as a surprise that we're revisiting those items because the discussions aren't completed. Oh, I, I don't want a foul call essentially saying, wait, why are we changing course? If, if we choose to do that. I just want to make sure that the manager has enough wiggle room because we haven't approved the fire contracts. Okay. So, and I don't want council to be locked into this because we're saying you're authorized to do the bond issuance, therefore we have to proceed down this line and we can't look at it given that the contract isn't yeah. done. So however the language is finessed in the whereas is, um, I'd like to see something like that. Just as a general point, though, let me turn back to Mr. Foster. Uh, with the adoption of the resolution, if there was a desire after adoption of the resolution to issue less debt that's than the, what is called for in the in the resolution, we can do that. What we cannot do is issue more debt than is called for in the resolution. 
that's that's correct i mean it's um the same issue in a different form that we confront with our budget i mean certainly you can um go or the tax rate yeah. for example you can go below the advertised tax rate you cannot go above that and so the same analysis would apply to this issue I, I understood all i'm asking for is just some language that says council's not locked in because the discussions aren't clear we could go in one direction we could go in a different direction on the fire contract i don't I, what i don't want to see happen is in our discussions with the county somebody holding this up and saying well council already acted you all agreed that this is how you were going to pay for them and you have agreed to purchase the apparatus which we haven't done because we haven't had a council discussion about it as a council i know that there's been some one-off discussions council's certainly been generally briefed about it but we haven't seen the contract so i'm not prepared to be locked in one way or the other right now but on the other hand we need to replace some fire apparatus fairly soon agreed agreed how we do that and for how much is the open issue and how so i'll i think we can do it in a clean whereas so that that would be my my one comment there and then as far as the mount daniel i take it the schools are on board with the mount daniel expansion piece yeah i think that's their their greatest anxiety right now is the is the, the um, issue of mount daniel and the enrollment figures at that age go, go and they're ready to <coughs> expand i they're they're ready to do the architecture and engineering work they've already spent money they're, they're spending money right now. That's, on that's why we did the, one of the reasons why we did the reimbursement resolution for this year is because we know that money has already been spent. Right. Those are, those are the questions and comments I had. Other council members? Ms. Fair? Um, I guess I had two questions, one having to do with the school budget, and, I mean the, the school expansions, and, and the other with um, City Hall. I seem to remember that, that embedded in the City Hall um, uh, expansions front and and rear um, were also some stormwater abatement issues right and and the, the neighborhood was particularly concerned about that and in fact this was this was sort of number two or three or four on the top it's number one. Oh, on number the one. top yeah. 11 and, and you that, know, that things. project is underway and that's already funded okay um, and that's not going to be reimbursed with this or is it no it's not that that was funded <coughs> um, in the FY13 budget, and so that cash stormwater. Yeah. So That's okay, but I just I remembered that that was also sort of embedded in the city hall uh, expansion. And then the second question has to do with um, um, all these various um, uh, school infrastructure costs. Um, there there have been at least you know in in my experience on council at least one situation where um, the cost for um, uh, an expansion was woefully under um, underrepresented and in fact went from you know a number to now probably two million what happens in all of this if um, you know if if the costs you know significantly overrun that which have been presented here is it what happens I'm gonna let you answer that question <laughs> thank you <laughs> um, typically what would happen would be um, the party that did the overspending would come back and say, we need more money, and we would have to find a way to fund it. Um, either we would go back and do another bond issue, or we'd find cash. So they would need a budget amendment? I say they, because it would never happen on it. Would never happen um, it. The, uh, there would need to be a, a budget amendment. There would need to be an amendment to the CIP. And then with that, we would ask for a reimbursement resolution so that we could proceed. And then we would reimburse ourselves down the road with a bond issue. Okay. All right. Anything else on this? Could I go back to, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Phil. Uh, could I go back to where Vice Mayor Snyder was going on the City Hall question? So um, as I understand uh, the answer that you gave him, the $3.4 million is uh, money that will buy us uh, health and safety improvements that will have a shelf life of how many years? At least 20. Okay, so these are long-term health and safety improvements. Uh, that is distinct then from the 675 and the 300, which will buy us an architecture and engineering analysis of 
some kind of expansion. Is that that correct? We're we're spending nine hundred seventy five thousand dollars to get some idea of what an expansion will look like. Yes. Then that dollar amount is full A and E. We will stop at the A, the architectural piece, twenty percent, and do community input and council touch point before proceeding to spend the rest. So only twenty percent of that nine seventy five would be spent before we would engage the community in a no, that's not right. Everyone's just saying no, when crazy. twenty by twenty percent architecture that means like you're twenty percent complete to being able to have a document you can fill out to bid and actually build. So 20% is not super detailed. It's enough to give you an idea as to what it's going to look like and whether it's good options. That's what that's referring to. And give enough to engage the community because it will be something to react to than the broad concepts we've talked to date during CIP discussions. And the, the ultimate bid documents, which is what the full amount would get us to, those are very complex, and that's why it's, it's fairly expensive. I'm not sure why you all shook my head then at what I said. So the 20% is going to buy us something that we will then show the community before we commit to the yes. more detailed document. I, what I was shaking my head at is I it's thought you meant there's 20% of, of the, the 975, 975. and that's it's not that is not the case. That's not how we intended. This is this 975 for all intent and purposes is the 20%. Ah, okay. So we're spending 975. No. That's, that's not what we're talking about. Oh, <laughs> I have encumbered now that we know what encumbering is, in a purchase order with an architectural firm, 343000 to do 20% for front, rear, parking, HVAC, windows, and sprinklers. And each of those are sub-broken out into the four projects. Okay, you know, I love you guys. I really do. But we are deep enough into this project that somebody like me asking a question like that, you know, we need to get on the same page. So, uh, all right, let me turn the page. Um, the constituent feedback that I don't know if what Mr. Sanders is responding to, but the two letters that we received are from Brian Williams and Eric Pelton, who are members of the Economic Development Authority and well-established businessmen in the community. They, to me, when I read what they write, and I won't, of course, read what they wrote because counselors all received it from the clerk, they have a fundamental question about the rehab versus build new. Uh, from what I'm understanding, you've just said we're going to spend $3.4 million for a pretty significant rehab that's going to last 20 years. And if I vote for this, we're going to spend another 900 well, sorry, we're going to spend some other sum that has six figures attached to it uh, for the community to look at an expansion of the current building on the current footprint. And what I hear from at least these people is that that's not what they're interested in. And, and all I'm asking is that before we go to vote on this, uh, we have a staff response to the concerns that they've raised, one, and two, uh, that we have some opportunity for council discussion of whether that is what we want to do, uh, whether we want to go ahead with this $3.4 million plus some six-figure sum that will uh, rehab and scheme out an expansion on the current site. Iron then. Uh, Phil, we all know that you would like to tear City Hall down. So let's we don't have to go dance around that issue. You're not really interested in uh, other uh, information. You just want to delay. You want to temporize just to create enough smoke and mirrors to prevent us from going forward. We've been talking about that for three years before you came on, and now we have to rediscover the wheel again. This is, we have an issue with public safety. The judges have said that there's inadequate safety here. It has to be done. So just come clean and say, you, all you really want is to tear down City Hall, and let's have that discussion instead of continuing to see we need to consult the citizens, and I have a, a, a letter here and a letter there. That isn't what this is about. No. Why you want to tear it down so bad can speculate. But this is a gem of a site, and I've already gone through this. There'll be a plenty of time for discussion as the touch points that have been mentioned, and I cannot disagree with you more on the way this is being handled 
and in the position that you've taken. And just just going back to um, the discussion that we had on on this point, I, th I think the notion was that there were numerous documents, um, CIP, various resolutions that the council had passed, mm -hmm. and I think where we left it as a council, and I think looking over the minutes, was that we were going to move forward um, in this process, and if any council members wanted to go into a different direction, they were going to raise it by our last meeting. I think that's where we left things, that there would be an opportunity to vote on items during our regular meeting to go in, in a different direction. And I didn't see anything come forward. I'm not sure, Mr. Mayor, that uh, I'm asking to go in a different direction. That that's what I guess I would uh, I would put Th forward. But which no, is why I, I didn't I'm bring not, anything I'm not up. Reacting. I mean, I'm simply asking Phil, for the I, staff I to provide us with decision I, I support information. I wasn't I wasn't reacting to your comments as much as I was responding to to Mr. Kalen's comment about where we're at. Um, at. At this point, I think comments that we've gotten back are certainly ones that we've thought about whether rehabbing makes sense or raising makes sense. Um, so I think we've had those discussions. Um, and I think it's important to respond to, the, to those about why we're going in the rehabbing versus rebuilding on the current site. I, I mean, to me, that, that's a legitimate question. Um, I did not read those emails to propose alternative sites necessarily. Um, certainly that's not what my thinking is, but I think it is a legitimate question that we've discussed about does it make sense to do this um, rehab effort or does it make sense to do a, a downright rebuilding of City Hall? And I think based on the feedback that we got from staff and the consultants, the notion was what we're doing given our budgetary parameters, et cetera, it makes sense to, to focus in on the critical issues like public safety, et cetera, and then take a more um, deliberate look at um, and get responses back from the community and check-ins on the expansion pieces. Mm -hmm. I think that that's sort of a rough summary of, of the community discussion and the council discussions that we've had on City Hall. But it's not that we didn't think through this notion of raising or fixing, if you will, at the current site. That's helpful. I'm sorry if I jumped on you. I didn't mean to. Um, all I'm trying to establish is exactly what you said. There's a cost associated with building uh, a building such as the one that the staff has presented to us, rehabbing and remodeling, that has a certain number of square feet. And there's a cost associated with building new. Uh, and, and I'm just trying to get some idea of how much those costs differ and how much the lives of those two facilities differ. So, you know, if we're going to get a 30-year building for less than $10 million, uh, then the community may well decide that's a great deal. If we're going to get a 20-year building for $25 million, the community might want to know that we have an option uh, that could be costed out to get a 50- or 60-year building for a figure that would not be twice that. And that's the only information that I'm seeking in all of this in spite of the characterizations that my good friend Mr. Kalen continues to make. I'm just trying to put data in front of the community so that they can make an intelligent long-term decision. That's what these two gentlemen who've written us letters have written to say. Why don't we go to we have Vice Mayor, Mayor Snyder. Uh, I think the city manager is almost jumping out of his chair so let, let's turn to him first and then um, I, th I think I understand this in a way that avoids, it doesn't avoid the fight, but it actually provides useful information to the public. Go ahead, Mr. City. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. I, I was just going to note, I, you know, what would be very helpful to the whole discussion is, is some cost estimates of, of the various different options. When the Dewberry study was presented, and now it's, you know, four years ago, um, five years ago, where different options were considered, the options of moving City Hall to a different location were dismissed at that time because the cost differential was um, prohibitive. And we haven't brought those forward because that's a dated study. It's five years old. There were some assumptions behind it um, that have changed since then. One of 
a big one was that they were recommending that we needed 80,000 square feet of office space compared to our 40,000 that we have right now, and that was dead on arrival. Uh, so we've tried to uh, uh, right-size this for the size of our community. But in terms of the cost estimates, um, to have a good professional um, set of cost estimates, the library study will have that in terms of their options. Um, that would be one of the tasks of the architectural work that is proposed here to, to get at that question. So we, we believe that that's forthcoming. If we were to try to produce it right now, which we could try to do with our best use of industry standards, we could do it at the staff level, um, but it would not be, you know, a, um, you know done by a, a trained professional. It would be done back of the envelope. But I do think that when you look at those numbers, in the past it's been very clarifying to the whole discussion about the merits of staying here, along with the other value considerations that have been articulated. Um, um, if the council needs those, we can try to do a staff refresh of those numbers. Um, if, if it's, you know, my preference would be to allow a professional to do it so it could really be a solid analysis and we would do that with the architectural work. Included in the budget. Included in the budget. Yeah. M Mr. Mayor, that, that's great. That's exactly what I was going to ask, and I had asked that before. We need solid numbers to look at the different options. The community doesn't have that. And the way I look at this bond issue is that whatever we do with this, we're going to need a city hall function. We're going to need a place for people to work, to, for the public to be received, to do the public's business. And I see this particular bond issue as maintaining the building, getting at things that need to be gotten at in terms of public safety, and then also the A&E work, and I'm glad that we're going to have some costing of different options, and that way the community will have the kind of information you need. You, you can't make a comparison between options unless you know what the cost of each one is going to be. So I see it as, as getting at that. So I. That, that's why regardless of this larger debate, which will go on, I think this work is essential for the safety and well-being of the employees that are here, period. It, you know, correct me if I'm, if I'm not right, but that's the way I see it. And then the A&E work is going to give the community valuable information to engage in a further discussion about what we, what we want to do. And if I may, Mayor, we, we tend to talk about a reference to City Hall, which tends to refer to just an office function. And there is certainly that, why and I sit in an office, but there is the, the public works and the, all the other functions, and most importantly, the police station is here. And so I just wanted for the community watching this, this is not just renovations for public safety for citizens coming in, which certainly there is that, and for the regular staff, but it also serves as our police station and court function. Thank you. Okay. Ira? Uh, thanks for the clarification. Certainly public safety, as, as was be we began our meeting today in recognition of public safety issues, uh, is very important, and I think it has to be addressed uh, uh, immediately. Uh, the way it was described, I had, I, perhaps I misunderstood, Phil, but the way I heard the conversation going was wanted to stop this bond resolution or this portion of the bond resolution pending these other studies. If I misconstrued, I withdraw my comment. As long as we go forward with this and take care of the absolutely essential rehabilitation and look at what it's going to cost going forward, then I'll let you then it's fine with me. Okay. So else? just to be clear, uh, what Cindy said is that the A&E will include uh, a rehab option and a build new option, and, and those are the two. What is that not what she said? Okay, then I did not hear what Wyatt said correctly. The, I, I think that the architectural work um, would be uh, focused on this building, but I think it's a preliminary step to actually doing architecture on this building. If the council des desired, as part of the scope, we could update our numbers in terms of the cost comparison of a rehab here and expansion here versus okay, that's moving that's somewhere that's else. That's, that's, that's exactly what I thought he yeah. said. And I pulled that for the reasons that he stated, that we're operating on a five-year-old space, space on an 80,000 square foot building, that we, you know, we, we use the 
discussion and we've headed down the road and this is yet one more step in that process of citizen engagement but simply holding open air forums where everybody throws new ideas on the table we're going to get us anywhere what we need to do is have some professional help to refine design and then evaluate real options and I, 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 as, as I think Dave said and so I think that's why we need to move ahead with this because that's I don't think it's inconsistent with what you're saying but the, the, the way to do it is not to simply say step back everybody has lots of opinions on things and unfortunately a large part of the community doesn't sit here in meetings like we do every week and spend many hours on this and doing the research and it's not quite as educated an opinion at this point so we need to come up with something more concrete we can present to folks and say weigh in weigh in and then we have to make decisions about what's best based on what we know about the finances and the growth trends and the projections and because they're, 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 they're otherwise you don't have we're the ones with all of that knowledge who are able to pull that together doesn't mean we're not, we're not getting additional input but I think this is another step in the process does that make sense yep. Yep. Yeah. The, the idea that, as I understand it though the the expenditures that are contained in this are independent of the options going forward this is a rehabilitation of the existing physical plant because of the major problems that exist for this physical plant the architectural studies and the cost analysis and options would be part of the architectural review I guess it would be there's no commitment to 80,000 square feet or anything else but it is simply to make sure that the people who work here and the citizens who come here and the judges who come here have a place that's safe and is functions and we're not putting anybody at risk for the reason Cindy well stated. That's what this is about. I cannot agree that even that gets postponed pending a community discussion. And to be clear, the proposal that's adopted by council and the CIP for the 11.7 .7 million rear front renovations concept um, is a revised version from the 2008 study. It adds 7,500 square feet, so this building only becomes in total about 50,000 square feet. And, so and we're, we're not doing a teardown and relocation and in what's adopted. And again, we, we've had some comments made by council members about sort of community engagement. Again, that I think it's important to look at our process as a whole. So we had the study that came out in 2008 where um, it was pretty much done on arrival. I think I was a new council member coming in when that was done or shortly thereafter. Um, and several council members, or Vice Mayor Snyder, I think, was on the council then as, as well. Um, and since that time, there has been a lot of community discussion, whether it's been in the CIP context or in planning documents, et cetera. And your appointed task force and for the city appointed hall task force. Safety which included boards and commissions and certainly the CIP. So I think the boards and commission process has certainly weighed in on this topic. Am I, am I missing something in that? It's not like we're taking this up for the first time. Sorry, I was. So. Uh, you know, I'll save you guys a lot of breath because plainly everybody wants to go home. Um, I just want. I don't think it's about people wanting to I go home. I just want the cost estimate on a 50,000 square foot new municipal building built on city-owned land here you know I would like that to come through a public process that we pay somebody to do it so that I am not accused of going behind backs or doing something you know subterranean to get this information I mean things that were considered along the way, along this process. 
we, we rate that. So, so you're comfortable with the, the data that we have at hand now that shows the cost of a 50,000 square foot building, which is a little bigger than what Cindy's building, but I sorry, don't, don't what, what's being proposed? But it's not too hard to sit down and, 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 and do a back down or calculations about what new construction costs. Okay, that's well that's, okay. Please, if someone could do that uh, through a we public process, yeah, that would be great. That's yeah, all I'm asking. That data's there and it, it, it looked at it can be updated. I mean, it's, 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 it's going to cost so much for square foot for the, the level of the kind of building you would typically go into. The, the, the site issue is another big okay. yeah. Yeah. that has a huge impact on, on, on the price and time. But Wouldn't need public. Thank, thank you very much. If, if that, if what Mr. Pepe and everybody seemed, Mr. Snyder seemed to nod their head in agreement with, could be accomplished, then I am, I, I am fine in, in telling these two people who wrote and others that that's what we're doing. You're always kind of comparing it to that. I mean, that's, that's a given. I think by public process, that means the numbers made available for, for Monday when we take, when this comes up. I think what we're looking at is pretty much new construction I'm costs the for, pardon? How are we going to have the money by next Monday? Not going to happen. Well, how would you do that? Maybe tomorrow said, no. I'm leaving for Ireland on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready for a <laughs> redo. This is going to be part of the AU. This yeah. Is yeah, that's I fine. I can bring it back as part of the this AU. This yeah. should, yeah. should well not be out. held up pending the new numbers. It's fine. Right. Right. At the, again, if the AU yeah, includes 50K new building, current site, then I'm fine. And I just need a yes or no to that question. Will it or won't it? If the answer is yes, then we're all done here. If the answer is we're not sure or we don't want it or, we d or no, then I'm not going to be able to support this when we bring it to a vote, and I would hate to be in that position. Just because I couldn't explain to – I wouldn't have the information to explain to people why we are choosing to rehab a building whose life will be at most 30 years. If uh, council wishes to, I can change the scope and incorporate it and make sure we answer that as part of the A&E, but I would want proper time to flush it out. I know I kind of joked about leaving, but it wouldn't be properly prepared for a Monday vote. But we can incorporate it into some basic 50,000 square feet cost-benefit analysis, which I did some preliminary work on the last CIP process when this came up. We can dust it off, but I'd like it to be part of the A&E so you see the context of the on-site project. I, th I think you're, yeah. mi you think you're missing the point. The point is to delay this. That's what this is about. The point is not to do the three and a half million dollar rehabilitation. You're f and you're stepping right into it. Mm. This should be done as part of it. You, I don't care now what you do for the A&E, but the rehabilitation has to take place. That is something that can't be negotiated because the city hall is in that's dire straits. That's what I'm hearing. Well, I, I think that's what I'm hearing is that we we, vote it. we move it forward, and the only issue is whether we're going to expand the scope of the A and E. That does not mean that the 3.4 million gets held up. Right. 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 Uh, I, I agree. Let's move forward on the 3.4 million. Expand the A and E to include costing for replacement structure. And I think we're, I, from my standpoint, that's what I'll support because I don't want to wait another day for the work on this on this site. And I think that's consistent with what our direction was. And now we're just saying we want to refine a little bit of what the a &E is doing, but we are committed to doing the public safety aspects. Okay. Great. You just don't so it appears Monday with the, I think, two things that we just talked about. The audit function. Okay, and I'll ask uh, Richard if he could lead the discussion on this. Okay, um, I've sent around a memo uh, involving the internal auditor discussion. Um, I will tell you at this point that. Prince William County established the internal audit division in 1995. Um, but what they do, um, well, the major part of what they do is they devote 1,700 hours a year to service efforts and accomplishments, which is 
a report that um, that they prepare involving the service areas and and what you're getting for the tax dollar that's being paid. Um, I have seen the internal audit function on two different levels. Um, one uh, is where you have a person with a staff that reviews all payments um, and does special projects at the request of the governing body. Um, and to preface this discussion, the internal auditor, uh, or if you choose to contract it out, is someone that only reports to the elected body, does not report to the manager, it's not part of the manager's staff, okay? Um, and in both the scenarios I'm going to describe to you, um, that person group reports to the elected body. Um, again, uh, I've seen it at, uh, at a county level where you have an internal auditor that reviews all expenditures, does special projects at the request of the governing body. Um, I've also seen it where there was a, an internal audit division very similar to um, what Prince William does. And what they have is they have a staff that spends the whole year auditing various uh, city functions and issuing reports. They also issue a citizen's report where they um, take the uh, financial data along with program data and they tell the citizens how much it costs per unit of service, what gets accomplished, and how it can be done better. Okay, um, the discussion for us is, first of all, um, the type of internal auditor you want, whether you're willing to um, commit to staffing it, and it does require a commitment of time because any person that comes in now has to start with each department and go through establish some level of performance measure, establish um, what programs they're going to look at, consult with council about how council wants it presented. Okay, um, the cost for an internal auditor can run anywhere from 50 to 130,000, depending on the level of service that you want. Now, with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. And I don't want to try to get to decision on this tonight, but um, give people a chance to have ask initial questions, and then we can take it up because it's going to be a pretty substantial budget item as well. Mr. Carroll? Uh, since I was the, the person who requested the consideration of, of the internal order, I, let me tell you what I had been thinking. What you said is absolutely true. And if we were thinking of... Uh, perhaps a multi-staff internal auditor. Uh, that's the way one would go about it. Uh, the immediate concern that's driving me is that the city has terrific operational risk in which if a few people retire or have to leave at the same time, the city can be paralyzed. What is specifically concerning, I find, is we are looking forward to large borrowings to undertake fairly large capital expansions, particularly for the new school. Though you could add some of that to the library and the city hall, but it's much smaller. These will entail hundreds, if not thousands of transactions. And just checking to see if there is a voucher for every expense is not going to be enough. We will be at risk, Nader, of losing a lot of money if there's fraud or irregularities in the procurement processes that we are not even remotely staffed to undertake. I believe, Richard, you have no auditors on your staff. How many accountants do you have? Three. Three for all the city work. And then we're going to get $100 million or so, $150 million of new projects in which 
someone is going to have to be checking to see if not only if the vouchers and the payments match, but who are the vouchers going to? Is it actually meeting the conditions that what they were supposed to do, et cetera, et cetera? He's got, even if he's not going to be able to go over every every billing, but if a sample is the random sample, you can get an idea of irregularities or issues. We have a terrific exposure, and we could lose a lot of money because we do not have the staff to undertake the type of capital projects that we're envisioning in terms of that function. Other council members? Ms. Perry? Um, yeah, I wanted to um, uh, support Ira's, Ira's comments. As, certainly as part of budget and finance, we've been talking about the importance of um, an internal auditor now. In, in my particular case, in, uh, certainly in the nonprofit environment, um, you know, uh, third-party watchdogs like uh, Charity Navigator, GuideStar, uh, Better Business Bureau, are pushing harder and harder for this level of audit in an organization. I don't know if that's true in municipal governments, but it ought to be. Um, so rather than going through our audit, which we have to do, which is simply testing transactions and, ensure, and assuring, I'm telling you what you already know, Richard, but assuring that your, your financial systems are in control. Um, what more organizations are looking for are these sorts of nuanced performance measures um, and, you know, the, the relevance of your work and the cost benefit of your work, sort of what do you get for your dollar. And that's what I think um, uh, this internal um, auditor can do. But I absolutely support Ira's comments about um, the larger capital expenditures, the levels of um, procurement. Um, ensuring that there's no conflict of interest, assuring that the, that the bid processes, processes were, were appropriate. Um, it's just going to be bigger and larger, and we're going to be talking about lots and lots of money and lots of transactions. So I think we would be prudent to um, embark on something like this. Other council members? Vice President. Yeah, I, um, the notion of internal auditing is something that's widely accepted in corporate governance um, circles these days. and. I think we need to look at how we can do it in a cost-effective way, and maybe I'm thinking as we ramp up with some of these major capital budgets that we could include this as an expenditure in the overall project, if that's a possible way to go. But in any event, I think we need to flex. We need, it needs to be scalable, and, um, and, and so I'm not a, at all opposed to the notion. I'm glad that it was brought forward. I think we need further discussion about when would you do it, how would you pay for it, what's the best way to do it. You want it to be scalable, I think. Yeah. And that's and I'm certainly and my yeah. comments should not be taken about decision points on this. I'm fully supportive of this and that's why I want it coming forward. But there's a lot of questions about scalability, how do we do it? Um, a couple initial comments, you know, and again I fully support this um, process, but one question that comes to mind, for example, is that the staff report suggests that it should be somebody who's hired on as essentially staff um, that reports to the council, um, which makes sense, but given the amount of work, et cetera, and what the city could afford, for example, we may only be able to afford a staff person. And does that get us sort of the bandwidth when it's crunch time to give us the resources that we need, or are we better off using a firm um, I, I I'd just like to get a better sense of that, and it may turn out that the if it's an individual, we're essentially having the individual then contract out, and the person becomes more like an audit function who does a lot of contract management of an outside firm. Just want to get a better handle of what it is mm -hmm. we're talking about. So the general notion I support, but I want to best figure out how we do that and sort of keep it within the city scale. Um, what's the best way to manage that? And we don't we don't need to come to decision on that, but those are sort of my reactions. I, I will share this. Um, what you said and what you just described is pretty much where I think the the city will end up. One of the reasons why you have to have a staff person is because that person has to be able to go around to the various areas and get an understanding and that that's something that takes place on a daily basis i don't believe you can bring in a, a consultant to spend 1700 hours that's not going to work out very well okay and i think for you to cover 
the areas that you need to focus in on, it's going to take a staff person and then that staff person will contract out for um, some specific areas that you want to focus in on and that person can monitor it. Uh, and it, I agree absolutely with uh, what Richard said. I would be more than willing after my term ends to work uh, and help out. I had a, as an internal order of the IDB, I had 25 staff uh, working on, on our issues. So I have some familiarity with the breadth and scope of what an internal auditor does and uh, what needs to be done. But that's why financial controls obviously are sine qua non and that is the number one issue at the moment uh, for me in terms of looking because the opportunities for mischief are unbelievable when you have no one o overseeing large sums of money. It's an invitation. It's an absolute invitation for misspending and misdirection. Thank you. Okay. So I think the notion here then is it needs, we need sort of scoping. Um, I think, uh, Richard, you lay out sort of the next steps would be, so I think you've got council consensus to start moving this forward and bringing it back for further discussion and putting some more meat on the bones. Will do. We're on to the uh, RSTP grant application resolution. We do have Paul Stoddard here. He's been the architect of this uh, RSTP application. But in the interest of time, let me just note that what this uh, resolution would do is ask the council to endorse our application to the NVTA for $300,000 of RSTP funds to be used for implementation of pedestrian improvements throughout the city. It is uh, for the uh, um, year uh, 20, uh, 2020. 2020 year, so it's six years out is what this resolution will specifically add to the six-year improvement program. And so that's the basically what it is. This application would go to the NVTA uh, for ultimately for their decision. And let's just see if, if, a, if there's anything vital I've left out and if there are any questions. Uh, no, there's nothing vital that, well, I will provide a little bit more background and say that this is a recurring request that comes up every year. Uh, and it didn't used to be a six-year process. It used to be done uh, the previous fiscal year. You would apply for the next fiscal year. Uh, the state had a problem spending all the money that it was supposed to in a timely fashion. And so a few years ago, they switched to asking localities to put in uh, applications for six years worth of funding. The idea being that then localities could, could program the funds in advance and spend them all in a timely fashion. That's why uh, the application here covers fiscal years uh, 2015 through 2020. And, and I think if I might add, Mr. Mayor, that, that this is part of the region's effort to make sure that the benefits from transportation funding are shared around the region to reflect the fact that taxpayers from all around the region are paying in. So but my, I guess my only question is, can you see a justification or could we increase the amount or do you think this is really a continues to be a regional a, a reasonable estimate of what we need I think this is reasonable in uh, for the last uh, five or six years running the city has requested three hundred thousand dollars and received three hundred thousand dollars the only exception to that is last year when the city actually received three hundred fifty five thousand dollars so the city put in an application for three hundred and after looking at all the money available, the NBTA decided, you know what, Falls Church is entitled to more, so we're going to give them 355. Uh, and so I think that that process would would um, would carry forward. And the request and the money that we're asking for is sort of based on our pro rata regional share. So it's not like we could ask for 500,000 and get it. We'd probably get the 300,000. So it's a good balance for what's available. To Paul's point, we know it, we can program it and start working the projects. And without additional staff resources, we probably couldn't double the dollar amount anyway. Good, thanks. And this is all state money? Uh, it's actually federal money, uh, but it works its way through the state. Uh, so it's state money that filters down, uh, and then it's the, uh, the Commonwealth Transportation Board that makes the ultimate decision. Right. Through the MBTC. Uh, the NVTA is the regional group that Sorry. collects all the applications, submits them to the CTB, and then the CTB makes the decision. Got it. Okay. And as I've just noted before, since it's federal money, make sure my name, et cetera, is out of it. 
anything else on there? Okay, so let's place this on the calendar for Monday. And could we put that on the consent calendar? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. All right. And we can do this. I we'll take get a resolution out of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. John, that's, I take it, permissible for the way this works. We can do that. We don't need a public hearing on it. Consent is fine. Yeah, the resolution is fine. Okay. Um, the uh, next item is uh, an ordinance change that would increase the transient hotel tax from 5% to 7%, effective July 1st, 2013. This is to implement uh, the uh, statewide transportation bill. Um, the state is collecting these taxes now, and by adopting this and having it retroactive to the first of the year, we will get our share of that um, as it goes through the regional process. That's right. Um, that was one thing we, we ran down just to make sure that we could do this retroactively back to July uh, 1st of the, the beginning of this fiscal year, and, and the answer to that is yes. Okay. Anything on this? And this is, again, to bring it in line with the transportation issues. That's right. right. Anything? This okay. just makes our code coincide with right. the state code. Yes. Okay. And other localities are doing it the same thing. So I think it's I, – I just want to make sure that it's clear that this in no way sort of puts Falls Church at a unique disadvantage as far as bringing in hotels or other hospitality. Um, functions that this would apply to, correct? The bill was covers all Northern Virginia localities. Right. All right. So that takes us through our um, agenda for today. Any council member comments and scheduling items? Mr. Callen? Uh, I have a comment because I may make it at a council meeting as well. But I wanted, just wanted to refer to two articles that we received in our emails uh, regarding uh, Fairfax Library situation since we have uh, some decisions that we're going to have to make about the library expansion and one of the articles indicated I'll just read the first sentence or a couple sentences the parking lot was jammed this is vis-a-vis -vis the trashing of 250,000 books the parking lot was jammed cars snaking up along the road and into the neighborhood the reading room in Annandale was packed with a satellite location satellite location for the overflow <coughs> audience. We don't even get that for parking issues. Uh, two police officers in body armor stood at guard. This mob at George Mason Regional Library could get ruly, could get unruly. I won't read the rest of it. But that's how important it was to some of the residents about to the library. Then there was a post editorial, Washington Post editorial, that said public libraries can be sanctuaries, gateways to discover, discovery, and temples of learning. They are vital institutions promoting the health of democracy. To that end, among the more troubling trends in recent years has been the decreased funding for libraries across the country. Faced with perpetual budget cut uh, decline, cities including Detroit and Denver have taken uh, to shutting down branches and laying off staff. Libraries in the Washington area have well suffered. I see the library, I'd just like to add, that we can't compete with Tyson's for commercial, though. We can't compete for Arlington for a lot of the buzz. But we could certainly distinguish ourselves as a desirable community with, with important values by supporting our library and making it a focal point and something that will make Falls Church an even more attractive place to live and to set up than others and will stand in great contrast to what are other communities are doing. And it's not a terrific expense to get all that positive feedback and positive uh, feeling about the city. So I think this is, these are the types of things that we could take advantage of because I think in this area, the library board has done a great job and we're ahead of the game and could actually uh, benefit by the fact that we stand out alone a support to a sanctuary and a gateway to discovery and as a temple of learning. So I would like to support that and I hope that the other council members can take this into account when we go to consider the library uh, expansion. Thank you. Other council members? 
Mr. Johnson. Just one question about, Ms. Barry, do you know the library board is meeting, are they this Wednesday, and do they expect to hear from the consultant with something? Um, I don't know. I have the, uh, I have the agenda, uh, but I didn't. Uh, okay, well, if somebody, I'm not sure I'll be able to go, but if I have a chance, I would like to go listen in, and uh, just for the record, uh, you know, I'm asking for a, a library that would be 50% larger than the current one, 14K currently, 20,000 new. And, you know, I asked in a public meeting and got a very polite letter back from the library board uh, if the consultants whom we're paying good money could give me a new cost, a cost for new construction of a library uh, along those size. And I got the impression from the letter that I wasn't going to get that information, but, you know, I'm still going to go to the meeting and listen and try to come to it when it comes before council with uh, information on what a new library would cost. Uh, compared to a rehab facility. All right. Anything else? Um, I just had um, one letter I wanted to convey um, to the council. I don't believe that you all received it. Um, uh, retired um, Judge Karen Hennenberg uh, wrote um, wrote me just thanking for the proclamation. Oh, you guys got it. Okay, great. Okay. So it was just a very nice letter of appreciation from her. That's all I have. All the council members. Okay. All right. Um, Secretary for the evening. Yeah, everybody is going to be here coming up on the calendar. Can you guys just make two notes on your schedule? Yep. One, uh, we have a fifth Monday in September, and that Monday is off on the schedule uh, for uh, the council resolution. Don't tell Dave Carter. Okay. Yeah, wh what September it date is that? That would be September 30th. Okay. So that Monday is free. The other thing I wanted to know is uh, do we have a work session scheduled for Monday, November 4th. I have it marked down on the schedule as cancel. Uh, that is the, last, uh, the night before the, uh, the election. Um, we also, um, so that's a question mark and we're going to discuss that um, in, in the mayor's uh, agenda meeting because I just mm -hmm. pointed that out. But to make up for that one being canceled, <laughs> early November is when we were supposed to have that joint session with in um, uh, later that week and have that first July 15 budget planning for the week of November 4th. And my email I'll send out a request for three days. Okay. Go back to something that you said the night of September 3rd. That meeting to you said we're going to have rating leaders, the Lizzie Blooming Rating Agency, yes. after the referendum. Would you be keen to do uh, such a meeting before we go to the very large bond issue? Excuse me. The very large bond issue. So we'll have that before the bond referendum comes up. There will be a public discussion with the rating agencies as to what it is that they will be looking for in terms of uh, what the city's rating would be, what its financial condition has to be and so forth uh, in discussing uh, the city situation. I'm, as I'm asking now what your plans are for that. Uh, the meetings with the rating agencies before the issuance of the bonds? That Not are meetings, but just the large bonds. Uh, the large bonds. Um, in, in terms of our rating calls that would happen in November, the purpose really is to get a rating on the this uh, bond issuance of 18.8 million that we've discussed tonight. In that, in those calls, they will there will be a discussion about the overall uh, CIP and our projections for economic development, et cetera. And um, and so we will have that discussion. But specifically, we'll be asking for a rating for this issuance. I, I understand that. I mean, and and uh, rating agencies don't tell you what to do either. They just tell you do what you want, and then we'll downgrade you later if we don't like it. <laughs> Uh, that's that's the way they are. But before we, we really get into the the, the council will have to the, the the council to be will have to decide on what it promotes, what it wants to do going forward in terms of the bond issue. It would be very important that the council understand vis-a-vis -vis what kind of fund balance the rating agencies would want to see, what kind of financials they would like to see, and so that. The FY15 budget is consistent with 
a request if it takes place for the bond beginning of these bond issues. It should not take place after the information is set out for a referendum. We need to know, the city needs to know what are the rating agencies going to want to see in order for us to, to them pr believe that what the rating should be. You don't want the rating agency to say, actually, now that we see how your cash flow doesn't match up, uh, you're now going to be single A or triple B or double B and move toward junk because that adds a lot to your interest rate costs. And you don't want to get surprised by that. You want to know beforehand. So that would be very important to do before you make final decisions. I mean, because I think they're gonna, they may ask for a higher general fund, for example, more protection with the, with the level of uh, expenditure that we expect to experience. Uh, if I may, Mr. Mayor, on that note, um, those of you that may be interested, Standard and Poor's is doing a live video webcast on September 18th. That's Wednesday at 1230. And what they're going to be discussing is local government's geo criteria, and they also have and are receptive to Q&A. So it might be a good opportunity to ask those questions anonymously so you sort of get an idea of where you need to be. We can forward this we link. Can, yeah. We'll forward the link to you. All right. Okay. Anything else? All right. Um, I think we've got a closed session scheduled, and then uh, we're not going to be. We don't take. We, we don't have a motion coming out or a recommendation for a motion when we come out. So the only other public business matter that we'll be um, conducting when we come out of a closed session is just um, adjourning. Upon a motion made by Council Member Snyder. Thank you. And seconded by Council Member Harris. Thank you. And passed by a vo voice vote of City Council. Council went into closed session pursuant to 2.2-3711A3. Discussion or consideration of the acquisition of real property for a public purpose or the disposition of publicly held real property where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body to which the water system, Mayor Baruch, yes. Vice Mayor Snyder? Yes. Councilmember Barry? Yes. Councilmember Duncan? Yes. Councilmember Kalen? Yes. Councilmember Pepe? Yes. Councilmember Tart is absent. <laughs>